Thank you so much, Felix, and thank you, Anne, and my hosts here at the Control Center, and thank you to, to all of you for coming. I was wondering if we should do this in Spanish or in English? In Spanish. Is there anyone that doesn't understand Spanish? There are some people that don't understand Spanish. So I think we should do it in English, or at least try and, uh, okay, we'll go on in English. And maybe you'll have to stand some parts in Spanish too. Um, okay, so talking about uh, memory. Do we really get to conquest uh, memory or are we damned to, to forgetfulness? Borges seems to think that memory is mainly about forgetfulness. He thinks that forgetfulness is uh, made of the things that go down to the vague, a sort of vague base basement where the main, the, the, the most important things that we know stay. For him, forgetfulness is like a deeper stage of, of memory in a way more important than memory itself. And uh, I've come here to talk about a book, No Place for Heroes, that has been translated uh, with that title into English. And uh, in, in this case, or in every case, in every book, of course, trying to remember is very important. Uh, if it's your own memory that you're trying to recover, or if it's a collective memory, historical memory, and even if it's fiction, which is uh, harder because it's the memory of your characters that you're trying to recover. And of course, they don't have a memory because you're making them up. But it doesn't work unless you do recover their memory in a way and get to know who they are. And it takes a long time. It's just like, uh, like real life people. You have to get to know them before you know how they talk, what they do, and you make very uh, awful mistakes with them. Luckily, they have their own um, temperament and they tell you, they scream out when you are mistaking and they tell you that's not the way I am, that's not what I would say. I will certainly, wouldn't be doing that, what you think I would be doing. In this book, memory is very important because it's, of all my books, this is the only one that is sort of biographical. It's like the only time that I have dared to tell something about myself and, and my life. Of course, every book, every novel, even though it might be fictional, it's always autobiographical because the only person that you really know is yourself. But this one is explicitly autobiographical. I wanted to tell a certain episode in my life um, and I wanted to tell it uh, especially to my son. This is a book that I wrote for my son and for myself and of course for the reader, but mainly, this one's been mainly for my son because it was, it had to do with a difficult episode in our lives uh, which we hadn't been able to, to talk very well. And here we come. Is that me doing that awful sound? Did it go away? Okay. Um, because in this case, you have three kinds of memories, three different memories, and they seem to be all, each one of them is against the others. One memory was my memory, the other one was my son's memory, and then there was a collective or, or historical memory, and none of them seem to fit with the, with the others. Uh, of course, even if it's a real life story or a non-fictional story, once you turn it into a book, it becomes literature. And the characters, even though they might come from real life, they become literature too. I changed the names in the, in the novel. The mother's name is Lorenza, and the boy's name is Mateo. And the novel is mainly a dialogue between them. I suppose many of you uh, have teenagers for sons and daughters, and uh, so you'll know 
the big difficulties about keeping a dialogue with a teenager. My son is already a grown-up man, and he's a writer himself. But at the time the novel takes place, he is uh, a teenager. And the novel is written in the form of a dialogue, a very difficult dialogue between this mother and this son, who speak mainly two different languages and have very different ways of remembering what has happened. Um, this is a, it, it takes place uh, during the Argentinian dictatorship. Uh, I went there in the 70s, late 70s and early 80s. I stayed there for four years. The reason I went there was I was in Madrid where uh, many people were working uh, against the, the tyranny, tyranny, tyranny in Argentina and uh, uh, looking for help for the prisoners, the desaparecidos, and uh, trying to let the, or get the, the world to know of the terrible things that were going on, the horror that, that was going on in Argentina. So first from Madrid. Is that better? Is it better? Did we lose the whole first part, or can we go on? <laughs> okay. So, um, so we helped from 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 Europe, from Madrid, but of course, the, the, of all the people that the, that with me were working there, what we really wanted to go do was to go inside. No, it was like it didn't seem to be enough to do this pale help from. Uh, a foreign country, and, and we did want it to, to go in. Um, my work had nothing to do with arms. I actually dislike arms very much. I don't think it, they take too far. Uh, but anyway, all political parties were forbidden in Argentina, and especially if they were against the regime. So we did have to go underground. This is a story of people who are working underground against uh, the tyranny. Tirani. The thing is, uh, I went there, I began, I fell in love uh, with uh, another militante of the same organization, and we had a child, and that is my son. In the book, Mateo. There is something that Mateo calls el episodio oscuro, the dark episode, something very difficult that happens there, and here memory plays a, a hard role because the mother really doesn't want to remember that at all. And uh, it has to do with the kidnapping of the child by the father. At a certain point, the father takes away the child. She gets it back, the mother. But that is something that she never wants to talk about. And, and the boy does, because it does have to do with his origin, with his father. For him, it's urgent. Uh, to get to know what really happened. So the novel, in the first page, you will find them trying to talk, actually the boy asking, how was that episodio oscuro, that dark episode, how did it come to, to happen? And the mother is always trying to get away, you know, answer with, uh, in a formal way, because she has like a build up speech and she doesn't want to leave it. We, the people from the left, have had very much that. You know, we have our own speech. Not that I have changed my ideas. I mainly believe the same thing that I believed when I was a young woman. But I do think that we did have sort of a model in the way we thought and the way we talked, and we didn't like to, to, to go out of it or to look for uh, new ways of expressing things. So we have, here we have Lorenza and Mateo, and what they do, they haven't seen the father, the child's father, since he is uh, two years old. So they go back to Argentina. The, the woman is Colombian, the boy has been born in Argentina, but has lived outside for all his life. And they go back, and they begin looking for this man, the child's father, which isn't an easy task, because um, of course, in the underground uh, activity, nobody knew who the other person was. You weren't supposed to know. You shouldn't know 
because the more you knew, the more possible it was that if they made you speak, you might do harm to others, no? It's saying what you shouldn't say. So, and, and here, memory plays a role too. I mean, those are times where memory does not exist and it cannot exist. You cannot remember. You really try to erase anything that is in your head because the enemy can get hold of it. So you must not remember. That, I think it, this book was very hard for me. It took me five years, which is more than other books have taken. I didn't think it would at the beginning because it was like my own story. I mean, I thought it was something I knew about. But when I began writing, I, for the first time, I understood how hard it had been for me to put it out of my memory, to take it out of my memory. Uh, and at the same time, the big problem that my son had, or Mateo, in, in the case of the novel, Mateo, to get, to get his mother to, to remember what had happened. So they go back. They have no idea of where they might find the, find the father, because, of course, there were no addresses, no telephone numbers, not even the names. This Lorenza finds out what the last name of her partner is the boy's father. She finds it out after four months of living with him because they get the, the telephone receipt and the last name is written there. She's not supposed to know, you know. We had what was called Nombre de Guerra and that was like all you knew about the people that were with you, which was a quite a strange situation because, you know, you had to, uh, you were at risk all the time and you depended on solidarity on your compañeros. And you never knew where they worked, what their real names were, no talking about mothers, fathers, like real life was left out of this. So they begin looking for this man. And at the same time, I think what Mateo comes to understand is through the book is that Maybe the real problem is more the mother than the father. I mean, it's how to get to her and how to open up the dialogue. I, I think part of the difficulties I had with the book is that, of course, the mother was always like the center character. I suppose mothers were just like that. And uh, so the, 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 the son was sort of a pale character that tried to open up his mouth, and then immediately the mother would come with big speeches, no? To explain everything. Uh, luckily, I had my son who helped me out, and uh, these subjects that we hadn't spoken to much because it was like a hot subject, no? That wasn't easy to, to deal with. Luckily, I had him, and through the written chapters, it was much easier. Uh, we didn't have the direct talk anymore, but I would show him at nights what I had done during the day. And then we would fight over how it was written. If any of you have trouble talking about some dark matter with any uh, person that's near you, I highly recommend that you write a novel because it's a way of discussing it. Uh, you're not talking directly, so you're talking about literature, so you can open up and you can talk. Mm, I think my son made a good job for, for his character, I mean, for the son's character, and uh, trying to protect him and to make him sound loud and clear. And uh, it was quite painful at times because you really do think you're your children admire you very much, and that's uh, so, but uh, only to a certain point. They're not so, uh, uh, at some points, they don't agree so much to, to what you have done. And in this case, the, the political matter, the, the political matter came into action too, into, because, uh, of course, the mother used to think that uh, they had done well. I mean, they were the bad guys, the, the tyrants there, and they were the, the, good, the good guys, the ones that opposed uh, tyranny. But uh, for Mateo, it's not that clear that it all w that was worth it. I mean, what, what did you do? Is it, uh, you spent your lives for it. My, my father left me because he had this very important task, and uh, Mateo doesn't quite see the results. For him, it's not that clear. So the political discussion and the way 
some of you are not from Latin America, but the ones who are know that politics is always like in the heart of all of us. I mean, like we have a very hard reality that in a way is pro. We have the feeling that we have to complete it, make it, really take a big step to get into history. And so politics is, is always our business, even though we're talking about uh, something else. So there's a political discussion too, even though the terms might be different between Mateo and his mother. And here comes the title, No Place for Heroes. Mateo definitely didn't want to be told the story about heroes. And the, the mother sort of tends to do it that way, you know? There's your father, this very brave guy who risked his life uh, fighting against the awful gorillas. But Mateo seems to think that uh, uh, he cannot see a hero in someone that leaves a child at, at two years old. So the, the two generations also have a, a, a part in, in this, no? the, the difficulty to understand what goes on. Uh, I think the book, the, the way I, there are of course thousands of uh, novels that have been written about the Argentinian dictatorships, and actually all dictators in Latin America, of course, starting by the great masters, Garcia Marquez with the Otoño del Patriarca, mostly all of them have written about this. But the way I started out, like the intimate or everyday conflict before, between a mother and her son, I think forced me to, to give it a, a different angle. At a certain point, a journalist in, in Europe made a, was making pretty aggressive um, questions to me because he said, why are you talking about these intimate things if this is a political novel? And so I said, what I think is that we don't understand politics unless we begin to look at them from the inside. Otherwise, we sort of end up once again in the old formula where everything is sort of resolved or everything is clear with the good guys and the bad guys. But unless you really look it from the inside, you don't know what politics is. And uh, in the case of Argentina, this is especially clear because to my way of thinking, what really overturned the dictatorship, what finished with these gorillas was Madre de Plaza Mayo, the mothers from Plaza Mayo. And there you understand how deeply linked our intimate life, family life, with being a rebel and um, with politics. Because I suppose most of you must know what the Madre de Plaza Mayo did. But these were women who had, uh, they, they didn't belong to any political party, maybe not even had a very political way of thinking or of looking at life, or maybe they didn't even uh, regret too much the, the, the way Argentina was being led. But their sons and daughters at a certain point are desaparecidos, which is this terrible word that was made up by the dictators themselves. It means torturing, killing someone, and then say they disappeared, no? In a way, it seems like it was the fault of the, of the victim and not whoever has done this awful harm to them. So Madre de Plaza Mayo, what they did, and I saw them do it many times. I mean, we were working underground, but they weren't. There's the Casa Rosada, the pink house, where the gorillas actually lived and where they governed. And right in front is Plaza Mayo. And what this mothers did was, I'm talking about the end of the 70s and the beginning of the 80s. That's what, when the, the Argentinian dictatorship was harder and when most of the 30,000 desaparecidos, desapariciones took, uh, took place. So what they did was go out with a big picture of their sons or, or daughters, whoever has been desaparecido, and just walk around the plaza right in front of the, of the Palacio de Gobierno. They were called the, the, the locas, 
you know, the rest of the population call them the locas, las locas de Plaza Mayo, the, the, the crazy women, because what they did was so daring. But uh, I think they were always the ones that really led opposition to the dictators. Political parties did their job also, and uh, <laughs> union parties, and uh, uh, so the rest of the population came to sum up, but actually it was them who, who, be, who began and, and who took it further. After the Madre de Plaza Mayo came the Abuela de Plaza Mayo, grandmothers from Plaza Mayo, because the mothers themselves began to be disappeared by the military because of what they were doing. So they disappeared, they were tortured, many were killed. So Abuela de Plaza Mayo began to appear in the plaza with their, the, the, the pictures of their daughters and the pictures of their grandchildren too. So I think it's quite clear how politics and intimate life are really uh, the, the same thing and not understanding it that way. You're not understanding actually nothing. So that was like something difficult to, to undertake. And uh, then something else. How do you talk about childhood? Uh, it was important for me to make a strong character out of, uh, out of Mateo, uh, to respect him. And it's not always easy with a child, you know, infancia, Infancy, I don't know if the word uh, exists in English, infancy. Well, childhood, but infancia in Spanish comes directly from the Latin infare, which is that the one who doesn't talk, not to have a language. That is what infancia, childhood, means. So, of course, Mateo, as a child, doesn't have a voice of his own. Children don't have a voice of, of their own. They don't speak out loud only, but only through adults. Actually, one of the, because you discover things when you begin writing a novel, there are a lot of things that you take for granted and then you discover that they are different from what you thought. One of the things that I thought is childhood doesn't really exist. It's made up, it's a, a cultural invention. It doesn't exist uh, by itself. Um, actually, if you look at it historically, children were hardly seen, they were invisible. They didn't play an important role in society as they do nowadays. They were like, like small men, no? like uh, they had to work, they had a very hard life, no special considerations were given to them. So in a way, uh, childhood, as we see it today, like this protected place, where everyone is looking at and uh, taking a lot of care of, that didn't exist. I was surprised to discover that it's um, Christianity that in a way makes up childhood the way we understand it. And the reason is quite clear. They had a God that had been born, la encarnación, no? incarnation, like a main issue in Christianity, the God is born into mankind, he, he into mankind. He becomes a man. So if he's born, he has to be a child at a certain point. So it's interesting to see how they have to build up the figure of the child for the first time in art. Child, children appear. For instance, there is a, a picture by um, uh, Lorenzetti in the 14th century where you see there's the, the, the Virgin Mary and, and she has the child on her lap and the child is holding a piece of bread. And uh, it was not, it, it must have been quite a surprise to see a child in, uh, in, in, in the picture because they didn't usually appear. And so from the 14th century on, you begin to see religious art when the child, Jesus, takes a more and more, every time more important uh, place. But that used, didn't used to be that way. And it's easy to forget that children are children. In especially hard situations, children do not, are not regarded as such. 
And in a way, I think that's the big complaint that, Loren that Mateo has against his mother. Because even though she's always been a very dedicated woman and Lorenzo is, and Mateo is like in the center of her heart, this life in the militancia clandestina or the underground activity is not like very proper for, for a child anyway. So, so this is the way the, the novel goes. I, I don't want to tell you much of the plot, but I'm sure that anyone that has a child, which one, which is the conflict is not really the matter, but always how to reach to a child, how to sort of make a bridge that will take it to him. Uh, who's the father? That's sort of another invention, I mean, a cultural invention in a way. It's easy to know what, who you are when you're a mother. I mean, sort of nature tells you in a very direct and easy and, and clear way. But the father, who is he? Uh, actually, in the beginning, uh, historical times, of course, men did not behave as fathers do today. That has come to happen with time, too. Men taking care of their children the way they do. And of course, in these hard times, so when the book takes place, being a father was pretty much against all the tasks, all the political tasks that they had to, to do. So um, I would like to open up the discussion with you and to keep this uh, rather as a dialogue. It would make it much more interesting for me and I suppose for you too. So I'll be glad to uh, listen to you and uh, ask, uh, answer any questions or make you questions. Uh, the gentleman over here, and then you, if it's okay. He's happy with the book. Finally, he is. One of the things is uh, maybe the difference in generation also shows that I was. Um, I really didn't want to tell the story to him or to anybody, not even to myself. Like Borges said, it was like deep down in the basement of my memory, and I didn't want to pull it out. But he was eager to, to know who he is. He doesn't care if, uh, you know, like intimacy, privacy. I don't know if any of you are from Bogota here. I know Fernando is. And, uh, and how important is this to keep things secret in my city for some reason? I suppose all over Latin America, and that's why telenovelas are so popular, because they are always <laughs> revealing secrets, no? In, in a telenovela, no one knows who their father is, and everything that people do in bed is like a big secret, no one can know, and there's always a very angry aunt that will kill you if she finds out, or, I mean, secrets are very important. I don't know if it has to do with our uh, Christian tradition or what, but we're like very fond of secrets, and I do believe they do a lot of harm. Many of my novels have to do with secrets and the way they harm people. Secrets in the family, secrets in the state. I, I think they're always bad. There's no good secret. Telling things out loud is always good, and I think it, uh, it's mainly the job of the writer to, to tell them. But my son Pedro always thought that things had to be said. He doesn't like things uh, down there in the dark, like an octopus, no? Like, so, so he was happy. We had big arguments all the time. We, we yelled at each other quite a bit because it wasn't, uh, he wasn't satisfied with Mateo. He found the boy like shy. But luckily, I think I, 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 it was like a very bad novel until while well, the mother was the main character, I think it wasn't working at all. But then luckily, I could uh, like keep that mother quiet a little bit, which is never easy. Uh, but once I managed, I think the, the character of Mateo got to grow. And, uh, and I thought I could publish the book if I could make the reader find in the first page like a child, well, it's not a child, it's a teenager, but that hasn't been able to grow. 
or to stand on his own feet. And I thought, I will have a novel if by the end, when the reader closes the book at the last page, he finds a grown-up man. And he finds that through the novel, this Mateo has grown up and has found the way to look for his father, but not through the mother, but by himself. So luckily, Pedro is not here to tell me I'm wrong, but I believe he's happy with the novel, yes. It all has to do with secrets, too. If, uh, if you look at it that way, the Lidio is all about revealing a secret. Madness is always a secret in, in, in families. And I have found out that not only in Latin America, but all over. You know, after these events take place, many times people come to uh, have their book signed. But that's just like the pretext, because the real reason is like this short while, like it's like a confession, no? where the person that has read the book comes up to you and, and, and tells you what happened when, when they were reading and what the book uh, said to them. And usually the, the person that comes near you has like a special question or has something to tell you. And with the Lidio, it happened to me that many people came up to me and told me this is the same thing that we're living, that, we're, that, that we live in our house because we have this person that's a little bit nuts and we're having a heart trouble and uh, we don't tell anybody and so. But the Lidio is, the big secret is of course madness, which is not, not only in Agustina, that's the main character in the book, but it comes far, from far back in the family from uh, her grandfather, no? And it has to do a lot, of course, with the social situation and with social secrets, too. Agustina is a woman that becomes mad. The story is told in part by her husband, Aguilar, who has been a literature teacher at the university, but then the crisis comes and he ends up selling dog food, which I suppose many of us will have to do eventually. Uh, but um, he, he comes back from work one day and he finds that his wife has gone completely out of her mind. And this man is not a psychiatrist, he's not a psychologist, he has no idea of how to deal with madness. And, uh, and he has to deal with this woman whom he loves very much and whom he, he tries to help. The, the, the scenery, uh, where this goes on is Bogota during the times of Pablo Escobar, where secrets, of course, were very important. I believe that all this thing about the war on drugs is mainly a secret and a very bad secret because it ends, it destroys everything but drugs. Drugs keep on going and, and coming. And uh, also drug dealers. Uh, but, but the rest of society sort of comes apart with this sort of big lie that is war on drugs. So behind Agustina's madness that has to do, you read the book, you know, with deep family secrets was this big social and political secret, uh, which had to do with blaming this situation that's tearing apart countries like Colombia and Mexico because actually I, I said like, 10 years ago that Colombia and Mexico were not going to exist anymore as nations because of what was going on. And I think, uh, in a way, it was true. I mean, a nation is uh, a place where democratic process does take place, a real one, and it's not happening. I mean, you can hardly live in those places because life is not granted for, for anyone. So the secrets in Agustina's family has also a lot to do with this big secret about drugs and war on drugs, and of, of course, behind it all is Paulo Escobar. You know, I have a, a theory. I believe that Latin American literature is strong in many ways, and it's also weak in many ways. We have a very strong tradition of epic um, tellers. 
and uh, we tell stories and I think there are many people in our past and also of course in our present that are very good for telling stories in an, an epical sort of way. Uh, but we're very bad when it comes to intimacy. Everyday life sort of escapes us. I don't know if it's because we live uh, such a hazardous uh, existence that everyday life is, we don't even have the language to, to, to name it. And it's strange, you know, because uh, literature in English or novels in English are in a good percentage made out of everyday life, of, uh, of, of intimacy. That you don't find much in, in Latin America, except for a few, you might find a few exceptions like Onetti, but that's not something that's, uh, maybe because reality, the outside world is too loud. We still have to deal with it too much to really listen to ourselves or to come to like a lower tone. No, no, no. We, we, we're always speaking out loud. And uh, whispering is like not our thing. So in the Lirio, I tried to look at what was happening in a small apartment, this couple with the, the problem of Agustina going mad. And I think I managed to do it for a few pages, but after that, bombs began exploding outside and Paulo Escobar began doing his thing. And so it, it all turned into a very noisy novel, that one too. I haven't read him, unluckily, I haven't read him. He's the little boy that came as Ah, 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 of course I know who he is, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, of course I know who he is. But in a way, it, it does have to do, of course, a different situation, but it does have to do with the difficulties of childhood in a continent where, where political matters are so, are, are so strong, no? Children don't usually have the, the best part of it. So I suppose it does have to do, I don't know if someone has written his, his story. Uh, of course I read it in the papers, I don't know. If Maybe it's open for you. <laughs> <laughs> I think I did my part with this one. <laughs> I, so many hands up, I don't know. Okay. That's an interesting question for me because, you know, the, the dark episode, uh, well, actually you'll find it in the first pages of the book, so I'm not revealing too much if I talk about it, but it is after the, well, these romances, they used to be, and it happened not only to Lorenza, but it, it was quite usual that they were very strong while the, your enemy was there. And then once the enemy disappears, you sort of find yourself that you have like a stranger by your side, you no? Know? Because everything was about fighting against someone and uh, the rest like, didn't matter too much. In fact, you couldn't know too much about your partner because you were not supposed to know. I mean, you could not tell him what you were doing every day and you could not ask him what he was doing. So it, it was all very strong because at the end of the day, you, you came to your house, which was quite a miracle because it was very possible that, that they took you, no? Or that you disappeared yourself. And every night, finding him was like such a miracle and such a party because it was, you never knew if he was going to turn out. Up. So uh, love uh, in those conditions is very easy. It's much more difficult when none of that is going on and, uh, and there's just like the everyday routine and so on. So um, what happens here is the, the dictadura finally falls 
and Lorenza and uh, her partner part. They don't see each other anymore. They break up. And the father takes the, the, the son away. And, and it's interesting for me because it was like another subject that I wanted to, to deal with. And, and that, that was a, a very difficult one because it's always easy to say that these gorillas were very bad and that the people that were against them were good. That's like a, a, an, an easy schema. But what I thought that would be honest to say was, to what extent do people who fight someone, a monster like this monster that we had there, to what extent you don't begin to look a little bit like your opponent? Like it wouldn't be honest to say that it doesn't happen. I mean, to begin with, silence is forced into you. What happens to this Lorenza, who cannot remember, in a way, is the consequence of the enemy. The enemy makes you be quiet, makes you forget. You cannot have a memory. And Lorenza is a person that's deeply marked by this, as Mateo very well knows. What the father does is kidnapping the child. And one of the things that happened during the dictadura was the kidnapping of people. So the father, of course, in totally different context, and uh, of course, uh, people kidnapped by the gorillas were tortured and so on. And this is a kidnapping that's made mainly out of love, even it's, if it sounds so awful. But the father wants to reunite his family, so he just flies off and takes the, the, the child with him. But in a sense, he's doing the same thing that the gorillas did with people. He's kidnapping the child. He's disappearing the child. In a sense, this child has disappeared for his mother. So the, the dark episode is really dark because you're dealing with heavy stuff there. No? Maybe the final part, you know? Final part? I think so, because the start is always easy. But the thing is, like, you keep making, building up this huge thing, and then you are always afraid. What if I come out with something really silly at the end? Uh, I mean, there's, there's no guarantee that it's all going to reach someplace. The other time in an airplane, I got to, to fly. The, the, the man that was sitting next to me was a pilot. So you can imagine. Uh, there were a whole lot of things that I always wanted to ask a pilot, and I had him by my side for four hours, and I asked him everything I wanted to know. And I asked him, is the most difficult part of the flight, when, uh, when are we, the passengers, more in danger when at the landing? <laughs> and so he said, no, not at all. At, on the contrary, at the takeoff, because he said, the pilot is, is new, the, just has uh, the, the, the machine is, uh, on his hands. He has just had it for a few minutes, and he has to start with full power uh, with the machine. He doesn't know how it's going to, to respond. So he said, it's a takeoff. That's a tip I give to all of you. So you should be afraid when you take off and not at the landing. But when you're right, it's sort of, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the opposite. Because you can always start a story very happily. The thing is to, to, to get it someplace and not have the, the reader slap you on when, when he or she finds you because the end turned out so bad. Could you yell at me? Well, could you repeat the, the, the last part? I, I heard everything until the last sentence. Yeah, maybe I should give you my microphone. Well, my question is, um, as, an Amer as a Latin American author and having lived a very hard time in Argentina during the military government, with which eyes you're watching reality in the Arab world? 
should uh, these countries must be helped or they by themselves need to fight for their democracy? Thank you. Yeah, I, I think I see the world very much with the same eyes as I saw them back then when I was a young woman. I think the difference is now that in those days we were quite lonely and only a few people saw the world with those eyes. And nowadays it's quite difficult to see the world in uh, much better. I think we really have come to a dead end. Something must be done because many of us have been harmed with the way you, the so-called democracy is going. And I think there are thousands of people nowadays thinking, what did we used to think then? And it was, where can we go from here? How can we invent something that's different? How can we open doors? How can we search for a future for our children? I think that thousands of people nowadays are thinking that way because the, the feeling is quite extended that this just doesn't work. So uh, I keep seeing it with the same eyes and I have the feeling that, that I'm less lonely now in that sense that what we used to be back then when it was like a small group of leftists or so on. But nowadays, and between among young people, you, you find a permanent discussion of how are we going to change things around? It, it seems like the, the end of history or the, uh, or the happy ending with uh, the way the economy was going is, is not there anymore. So I suppose we really have to think hard where we're going from here on and how we can make democracy real. Because I suppose that we have named it so much that we have ended up with just the name. And uh, quite empty, no? Nothing to it. Just uh, elections, even though they might be a fraud, is enough to say that we have democracy. Well, now comes the time to really put uh, contents into the, the word because it has become quite empty, I think. Could you, could you take the microphone? As you were writing in the book, and um, remember in Argentina during the dictatorship years, and you also wrote a bit about Colombia, did you make any discoveries in, in terms of what you think about the countries today and how the cultural identity has formed in both of the countries and what they are now, uh, as you were writing in the book? You mean Colombia and Argentina? And Argentina, I guess more so Argentina than Colombia and you spend much more time on it in the book. You know, so, well, of course, it's uh, so wonderful for us Latin Americans to have such uh, a lot of uh, different countries and all speaking the same languages because we're not the same and yet at the same time we are the same. But uh, it, it's, it's funny for the readers from some place to find out that someone from another country is, is writing. I, I remember when I wrote the no, no Place for Heroes, and I went to Argentina, and, uh, and uh, I, I, it was funny to find out that some critic had written that finally the story of the dictadura is written in Colombian. <laughs> I was really not so aware that I was writing in Colombia, but in, in, in Colombian, but it seems that it sounded very, very Colombian to, to the Argentinians, no? Uh, well, Mateo tells his mother not to try to speak with, like, like his father, because uh, to imitate Argentinians, it never, I don't know if you're from there, but we don't, we don't do it so well. Um, <laughs> and then I have a novel that's called La Isla de la Pasión, Passion Island, it, it was published here too. And that it was written in Mexico, and that happened in Mexico. It's a, like a historical novel, or at least it's based on historical facts. And, um, and more or less the same thing, no? I tried to do it as close to reality as was possible, but it, also, it always sounds Colombian to, to Mexican people that, that read it. But that's, I think, the lovely thing that we have, that we're the same and at the same time we're different. Uh, he was talking with, with an American friend and, and he said that he didn't find it so great that all the states in the Union 
got to, to live life in a very similar lifestyle, no? In, like you could move up and down the United States and you mainly found uh, the same thing. In Latin America, of course, it's not so. We're quite different at the same time. We can communicate like brothers and sisters. I mean, you're at home uh, anywhere you go, including the Latin American population in the United States, of course. Okay. Um, they can't hear you. Um, you were talking about memory and forgetfulness in literature, and I was wondering what you were thinking. What do you? What was your view of those two topics in the Colombian society? Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm very surprised that the at how easy it is in Colombia to forget everything. I don't know if there's another country with such an ability to forget. We seem to forget everything. <laughs> it's like we were born every year because nothing that happened before. And from one country to another, you know, I lived in Colombia and now I live in Mexico. And it's like if I had seen a horror movie once and now I'm looking at it again. And it's like the same thing happening over and over. And, and the, how come we don't look to the other place and, and try not to, to follow the same steps, no? And, and we leave everything. Do you remember that, that fine film that's called Mem Memento? About a man that has no memory, so he keeps doing the same thing over and over. He has to kill someone, but he doesn't remember. He doesn't know if he already killed him or if he... So that's like just the way we are. I, I, I'm really amazed at, at, at how easy it is to forget or, or how politically useful it is for some people that the rest of us forget and how the press works hard at having everyone forget what's going on. Well, Garcia Marquez called it, no? La, la peste del olvido. <laughs> it is a peste, no? It is a plague, the plague of forgetfulness. Garcia Marquez knew well when he wrote a hundred years of solitude. That's like a main political issue. Why, would, why do we forget? Who makes us forget? Is it easier to live that way? Don't we worry about our children, like receiving the same old problems? And in Latin America, there are huge problems. I mean, they, they involve life or death problems. So. I have a simple two-part question for you. What is your definition of a hero, and who are your heroes, if you could mention a couple? That, that's an interesting question, too, and I had to deal that uh, too in the novel. Latin America, in a way, reality is so hard that you have a lot of people like having to fight with reality. No, what we were talking a while ago, it's not so easy like to go inside yourself and, and uh, sort of get to an intimate climate which would be needed for the novel. The novel is not supposed to be a gender that deals with action, but rather with a lack of action. No, it's like the anti-hero rather than the hero type. But us Latin Americans, we, we're still fighting with reality. So we tend to do novels where heroes uh, exist. So how do you write a novel? The novel is all about anti-heroes. Uh, that was difficult, and I think Mateo helped me because every time the mother tries to build a hero out of the militantes, there comes the son always to remind her maybe they weren't as great as she thought they were. But your question is an interesting question. Now, how do you deal with a gender that's made for, for non-action? It's the, like the contrary of action. It's the contrary of beliefs. It's the contrary of... Uh, it's, it's rather the life of someone that doesn't believe in anything anymore, and mainly who doesn't believe in his or her possibility to act upon reality. How do you deal with that in Latin America, where you mainly have, I mean, I think the forbidden part is intimacy, the part that 
isn't so close to us because so many things keep happening to us. Because we have the uh, book signing portion yet to go, I think we have time for maybe two more questions. If you could please come to the microphone, the first two to get here. I think, uh, bueno. We, we have a lady here and then, well, it's, I think it's going to be three if they're short. I'll, I'll answer shortly. I bring the microphone for her. Did you write the first uh, two or three versions in English or in Spanish? No, always in Spanish. Well, always in <laughs> yeah, Spanish? Yeah, they're translated, yeah. I oh, wish okay. I could speak English well enough to write, but <laughs> by far, no. <laughs> no, I thought about memory in, uh, usually come in our own language. So you mentioned several times memory, so I, I didn't know if the first two, three, four, five draft that you Always in Spanish. Well, but it would be a good exercise to try to write in another language, even if you don't speak it so well, because it will force you to think everything in a different way, you know, like turn things around before you say them. So that might be. In these days of technology and social media, how you deal with that when you try to do books and try people to read, and uh, how did that affect your work? Oh, I feel great, actually, because uh, I really believe that more people are reading now than ever. When they tell you or they ask you, why do you think people are not reading anymore? She said, I just tell them a, a bestseller of his time in the 19th century, like, the, like Charles Dickens, they used to publish 3,000 copies of his books. Just think what it is today. I mean, there are books that are being published and 40 million copies, I mean, it's, uh, it's huge how, how uh, the spectrum of, of readers have, has grown. Um, I, I believe children have always read, but now editors have discovered that children read. Uh, and you can see this huge volumes and the, the, the little ones reading them like it was uh, nothing. Women readers. When you go into a library or a bookshop, out of nine out of 10 people in there are women. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the internet, of course, has a lot to do with it. And there's something that I'm very glad about. I think internet not only makes readers, but it makes writers. Nowadays, everyone writes. Everyone writes. Like, like there was a taboo about writing, and, and now it's lost. And anyone that has, to, has a story to tell just tells it. Because you have the readers there. You just hang up your story, or, and then you have the readers. You don't have to go through all the process of publishing a book, which is always so, so difficult. So I think these are great times for reading and for writing. And it's, uh, it's been multiplied by, by many, many times. And I'm, I'm very glad. And after all, it's only, I mean, the, the writing is the same exercise. It's just a matter of technology if you do it in a paper book or if you do it virtually, no? Uh, hi. Hi. Um, my question is about the relationship between forgetting and forgiving, because sometimes it seems that in order to truly forgive, uh, you gotta forget certain things and that can be applied in the personal and in the political way. Uh, for example, oh, I don't know how many of the people here follow uh, a Colombian politics and in which uh, there was a peace process in the 90s and some people who previously, previously were guerrillas, uh, they were uh, forgiven by the government and right now they're doing politics. But every time, uh, someone is trying to attack them, what they're doing is remembering the people what they did before. So uh, isn't it uh, sometimes necessary to forget certain, not entirely, but just certain things? Well, that's quite a question or a statement. Yes, of course, what's the relationship between forgiving and forgetting? in Argentina where the book takes place, that was especially important, no? How can you forgive without forgetting? 
because it's not about forgetting. I mean, you cannot forget about the killings, you cannot forget about the victims, you cannot forget about who were guilty in that process, and at the same time, society sort of has, has to come into terms with it, no, in, in a way. But not forgetting, how to forgive without forgetting. I believe in this book, Lorenza tends to forgive, forgetting, and that's what Mateo doesn't like. Let's forgive, but let's forgive after we remember, and we remember every word of it, every chapter of it. Um, like a lucid, intelligent way of forgiving. I think that's what Mateo is after, and not sort of the blind way of let's believe, let's make believe it didn't happen so we can <coughs> forgive, but rather let's know exactly what happened and then we can forgive.